Good day brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome back to my channel. This morning we're going to continue with our Bible study verse by verse with Ezekiel and we're moving into chapter 6 today. And we've got to remember that just an overview of what's going on here. This chapter is a message of judgment against the mountains of Israel and the idolatrous practices of the people. So we see there's a prophecy against the mountains and here God commands Ezekiel to prophesy against the mountains and the hills of Israel. Okay. So we've got to remember that this symbolizes the places of idolatry where the people worship false gods. Okay, so here mountains are called to witness the coming judgment due to the people's unfaithfulness and then destruction of idols is the next area that God commands Ezekiel to um, expose so he declares that he will bring destruction, that's God upon the high places where the idols were worshipped and in this chapter we see that it emphasizes that the idols will be destroyed and the people will know that Yahweh is the true God. And then there's also judgment. And there's also a reference of remnant. And in this chapter we see it also speaks of judgment that will come upon the people of the country. Or Israel for their idolatry, including the fall of those who have turned away from God. However, it does mention that there is a remnant that will be preserved who will remember the Lord and turn back to Him. And then <clears throat> the last portion of this chapter is the recognition of God or of Yahweh. The purpose of this judgment is that the people will recognize the sovereignty of God and understand that He is the true God. Contrasting their false worship of his holiness. Okay. And then just the overview or overall, Ezekiel chapter 6 serves as a warning against idolatry and a declaration of God's judgment on the f unfaithful people of Israel. While he also is offering hope for a remnant that will return to him. So folks, let's have a look at my notes here. And before we go any further, can I ask you folks, please to subscribe to my channel. It's growing nicely, and if you could smash the like button, it just all helps to get the gospel of Christ out to a dying and broken world. It also helps with the viewing of the YouTube videos. If the more likes we get, the more likely my videos will be posted. So if you could do that, you're more than welcome to drop a comment in the comment section. And I'd love to hear from you. 
Um, okay, so, right, let's move on. So we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. So it's the judgment and restoration from idolatry. The first portion, as we've seen, is the prophecy against the mountains of Israel. A word against the high places. We find that in verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face towards the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. And I say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, to the hills, to the ravines, and to the valleys. Indeed, I, even I, will bring a sword against you, and I will destroy your high places. So let's unpack this and see what it's telling us. Set your face against the mountains of Israel. This prophecy was directed against the mountains because if we need to break it down, we see that they helped define the geography of Israel, that area where Israel is. But more importantly, these mountains were centers of idol worship. Okay, the infamous high places. And these are mentioned many times in the Old Testament. As we see here, right tells us in Jeremiah 3 verse 6 to 9, probably in any part of Palestine at that time you would have found some mountain or hill crowned with an altar, one or two standing stones, or a wooden pillar, or a clump of evergreen grass. Okay. Then in Deuteronomy 7 verse 5 we also see they were flourishing centers of the old Canaanite religion that would that should have been destroyed by Joshua, remember? Okay. Right, and Taylor also says here, each high place would have its altar of sacrifice, or perhaps a pillar, as we know, which may well have been regarded as a phallic system, symbol, and an image to the Canaanite goddess of fertility, Ashtara or Ashtaroth. Okay, so that's total idolatry. Okay, and then Block also mentions that because hilltops often serve as sites on the cultic ritual, on which cultic rituals were performed. Okay. As we can see in open cultic installations, regardless of their location. So right across Europe and right across into the UK, the United Kingdom, we see all these cultic religious areas where rituals were taking place. And then God even mentions the ravines and to the valleys. There must have been some similar worship in the ravines and valleys. As we see in Isaiah 57, Jeremiah chapter 2, and Jeremiah chapter 7. And sometimes cave worship to an earth mother. And also, as Jeremiah and Isaiah suggest, child sacrifice would be taking place in these areas. 
So the Lord tells Ezekiel, A sword against you, I will destroy your high your high places. Altars to pagan gods were often set on tops of hills and mountains in ancient Israel and on the border regions. This idolatry on the high places was inherent from the Canaanites and often practiced by the Israelites when they fell into spiritual unfaithfulness and started worshipping the idols of the Canaanite religions. God promised now that the judgment of the to bring judgment of the sword against these places and their idolatries. We also see that Ezekiel the watchman was to warn the people that an invasion was coming because God had seen their sin and was about to punish them. Okay. Verses 4 to 7 is the complete destruction to come. This is the description of the complete destruction. Then your altar shall be desolate. Your incense altars shall be broken, and I will cast down your slain men before your idols, and I will lay the corpses of the children of Israel before their idols, and I will scatter your bones all around your altars in all your dwelling places. The cities shall be laid waste, and the high places shall be desolate, so that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate, and your idols may be broken and made to cease. Your incense altars shall be cut down, and your works may be abolished. The slain shall fall in your midst, and you shall know that I am the Lord. It never ceases to amaze me how descriptive God's instructions are when he comes against false idolatry and false worship. And it just reminds me of the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games a couple of days ago. People are ignorant that there is a God of this universe, a creator God who created each and every one of us in his image. And all he wants us to do is to realize that he is Yahweh, the self-existing God, and to worship him and to honor him. Yet man in his rebellious state will never bow the knee to a supreme God a God who is sovereign and a God who is so full of passion and compassion and love that he sent his only begotten son to the world that is dying a saviour it's just Mind-boggling. Let's move on. I will cast down your lame man before your idols. 
here God promises to bring his strong judgment against the altars of idolatry and those who worship there. God would desecrate those places, set aside to pagan gods with the bones of the unfaithful in Israel. Matthew Poole also noted that God called them your altars. God's altars were only at Jerusalem. These were their altars. The pagan religion altars. This oracle announces that the time has come for Yahweh to clean house, to rid the land of its pagan worship once and for all. That's what Block quotes here as regards with chapter 6. Okay. And then also Alexandra mentions the scattering of bones is a phrase used for judgment in which uncleanliness and shame are conveyed as we see in Psalm 53, Psalm 141 2 as well. The bones would be of the Israelites who had become engrossed in these pagan practices. I will scatter your bones. This was literally fulfilled by the Chaldeans, according to Brock. They opened the sepulchres which are the tombs of the principal people and threw their bones about every side. That's what Clark quotes. The city shall be laid waste and the high places shall be desolate. So as we see in the campaign of Babylon, as Babylon's armies would come and destroy both the cities and the country regions. Desolate, meaning that no priest to attend, no sacrifice, sacrifice offered, nor a voluntary to come to them. Then we look at your idols may be broken and made to cease. This promise here was fulfilled. The devastating judgment did come, and when Israel came again into the land, they never had the same problem with idolatry as before. Feinberg says here, because the land had been defiled by idols, the idols themselves would now be defiled by the corpses of the worshippers. A rep uh, a retribution of kind of a kind. This would be the heart of desecration, replacing the fragrance of incense with the odor of putrefaction. That's how much God despises idol worship and false religions. You shall know that I am the Lord. Okay. This is the first use of the phrase repeated many times in Ezekiel. It shows that God worked in his judgment and his restorations to reveal himself to Israel and to the world. You shall know that I am the Lord. Let's look at that phrase. This so-called recognition or formula, which occurs some 60 times in this book, captures 
the theme of this prophet, God's motive in all that he does is that he might be recognized as the only God. That's what Smith quotes. And then he has the promise of a remnant. And in verse, verse 8 we see that. A remnant who escapes the sword. Yet I will leave a remnant so that you may have some who escape the sword among the nations when you are scattered through the countries. Yet I will leave a remnant. Let's have a look at that. The remnant was illustrated in the act out parable of the cut cutting of Ezekiel's hair. Remember in chapter 5 verse 3 and 4 when he laid down a couple of his strands of his hair and here God specifically promises to leave a remnant that would be the basis of a latter restoration. When you are scattered let's have a look at that some of the remnant would be among those scattered and some would remain in the land. So they would also be scattered, the remnant, and they would some of them would stay behind. The spiritual renewal, renewal of the remnant here in verses 9 and 10. Those, then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations when they are carried captive because I was crushed by the adulterous heart which has departed from me and by the eyes which play the harlot after the idols. They will loathe themselves for the evils which they commit in their abominations and they shall know that I am the Lord. I have not said in vain that I would bring this calamity upon them. So here in God's warning also, and the re reference to the renewal of the remnant, he says that he says things not in vain. So everything that he says comes to pass. Those who escape will remember me. God promised that one day that some of those who had been exiled out of the land of Israel would remember their covenant God and call upon his name. Okay. Paul here, with reference to this particular phrase, will remember me, my precepts which they have violated, my mercies which they have abused, my threats which they have despised, my promises which they refused, my prophets whom they persecuted, my judgments which have which have executed shall consider and return and seek me in their afflictions. So that's what Paul tells us in that quote. Because I was crushed by the adulterous heart. So here we see a startling statement. And God uses a human allegory which is a comparison to God's expressed depth of grief he felt over Israel's idolatry by liking him himself to a husband with a constantly unfaithful wife. So Morgan here in this quote states that the strongest figure possible is used to portray the divine suffering 
Okay. God is represented as broken. And Morgan also goes on to quote, The amazing truth is most vividly brought out in the prophecy of Isaiah. Okay, the book of Isaiah, remember? A man who was brought into an understanding of suffering of God, or the suffering of God, by his own domestic tragedy. Remember his wife? That is the force of these words. And Maya here also quotes, Our sin can give God the heartbreak because he loves us so much. Indeed, on the cross the Lord died for a broken heart. Of a broken heart. Of this, the issuing stream of blood and water was a sign. O heart of stone, thou too must break and loathe thyself when thou seest thy Lord broken by thy sin. So that's what Maya says with reference to Christ's suffering on the cross. When last did we weep over our sin? Folks, after the idols, this phrase, Israel's unfaithfulness to Yahweh was all the worst because of whom they forsook Yahweh for an empty, filthy, disgusting idol or idols. Ezekiel's choice of words for idols reflects that after the idols. The word for idols in Hebrew is Kulolimun. It is a favorite with Ezekiel occurring no less than 38 times in this book against nine times in the rest of the Old Testament. Its deri derivative is uncertain or its origin, the word, that's the word. But it is quite likely that is, is a homemade word consisting of the vowels of, he, of the Hebrew for which the dictionaries give the polite translation of detested thing. And the con consonants of a noun meaning that it's a pellet or a pellet of dung. The final contribution carries about it as much disdain and revulsion as any word could do. So here in this quote, Taylor tells us the word that Ezekiel uses more than 38 times to describe the idols is putrid, is really and truly a detested thing. They will loathe themselves for the evils which they committed. First they would remember the Lord. Then they would be deeply shamed for their sin. It was a terrible but necessary step in their restoration. 
brothers and sisters in Christ, I need to ask, and I've done this, and this is where I am at this moment in time. When last were you so deeply ashamed of your sin against the Lord? Ponder on that in this coming week when we go th- when you go through chapter six. Understand the grief expressed. I was crushed by the idolatrous heart. This is connected to they will loathe themselves. On both divine and a human level, it could be said one day you will realize how your sin broke the heart of those who loved you. And most of you will hate yourself for it. Folks, can I ask, we need to do this exercise. We need to do this. Come to the Lord as a broken human being, realizing what we've done to Christ. While we've got a chance here on earth. Don't leave it until the last minute thinking that you're going to squeeze in. Because you're going to get to a stage where you realize that your sin has broken so many people in your life. Ask for forgiveness. Repent. Turn to the Lord. Seek that person that you have offended. Don't think it's not going to come back. These things have a tendency to have everlasting consequences unless we deal with them and put ourselves right with the Lord. They will loathe themselves. They shall bleed inwardly and blush outwardly, deep detesting their former ab- abominations and not waiting till others condemn them they shall condemn themselves they would loathe themselves for their ab- abominations not merely some of them, as it is a hypocrite's repentance, which is but for some this of the reserved remnant shall be sound. It <coughs> is of all abominations, of all kinds of their abominations. They shall know that I am the Lord, this phrase, after their repentance. This is the remnant. They will be restored to the relationship with Yahweh again. The certain calamity God brought upon them, as severe as it was, would fulfill its corrective purpose in the people. First of all, we can see the progress that is so often still evident. The remembrance of God, the repentance from sin, and the relationship restored. Doesn't that encompass the Christian walk? Clark here says, those that escape the sword, the pestilence, the famine, and shall be led into captivity, shall plainly see that it is God who has done this. It shall humble themselves on account of their abominations, leave their idolatry, and worship me alone. And this 
they have done from the Babylonian captivity to the present day. And here we block also mentions the escapees will emerge from the dispersal amongst the nations, a transformed people. The process of transformation is not without its ironies. First, the spiritual renewal will occur on foreign soil, which most Israelites consider unclean or defiled. Second, to many Israelites, contact with Yahweh depends on residence in his land. Now they would learn that the very opposite was the case. Continued presence in the land signif signified God's rejection. This future lay with the exiles. Here we see in 11 and 12, God reveals to Israel through his judgment upon them. It is a call to anger and mourning over Israel's great sin. Thus says the Lord God, Pound your fist and stamp your feet, and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. He who is far off shall die by the pestilence. He who is near shall fall by the sword, and he who remains is the besieged and shall die by famine. This will I spend my fury upon them. Spend my fury upon them. Pour out or pound your fists and stamp your feet. God told Ezekiel to say the following words with those strong gestures. We needed to arrest the attention of Israel because they regarded their idolatry as a light thing. God saw them as evil abominations. Yahop and Watra say, clap your hands and stamp your feet are instructions that intend both to draw attention and to convey a, from a, pro a pro pro promotion of threat and defiance. They shall fall by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. The coming judgment would be complete and devastating as Ezekiel had said in his previous chapter, God would spend his fury, fury, fury upon them. Emphatic warnings were directed to them in the light of the three dreaded calamities predicted, which is by the sword, famine and pestilence. They or there would be no escape when those somber horsemen began their ride of death. That says Feinberg. The last two verses God reveals his judgment against Israel and their idolatry. When you shall know that I am God, sorry, let's start again. Then you shall know that I am God. When the slain are among the idols all around the altars, on every high hill, on every mountain top, under every green tree, under every thick oak, wherever they offered sweet 
and says, To their idols, so I will stretch out my hand against them and make the land desolate. Yet more, so yes, more desolate than the wilderness towards the heart. In all their dwelling places, then they shall know that I am the Lord. But that's good. Okay, so now let's have a look and break this down. When you shall know that I am the Lord, then the slain are among the idols. The fulfillment of these prophecies would demonstrate to Israel that Yahweh was their God, a worthy and worthy of their re repentance. They would and did reject the idols after these severe judgments. Stretch out my hand. This notice the greatness of the blow. Great God striketh hard when he stretches out his hand, and therefore you find a mighty hand joined with outstretched arms, more desolate than the wilderness in Debar. This, or there are some ancient texts that read Ribar instead of Debar. It may be due to an error in copying of the text, because we know Ribar is a place in Syria. The exact meaning or place of Dibar is unknown. However, in Ezekiel 6 verse 14, um, the received Hebrew text reads Ribar, but not Dibar. This is undoubtedly due to a scribal confusion of the Hebrew letter D and R. A ring a thing that has occurred several times over the transmission of biblical texts. Okay. So here, in some Hebrew manu manuscripts, we see that Reba is a city in Syria, and it seems to fit. God promises, promised to devastate the land. From the desert of Rebar, that is from the south to the north. It's like saying from Dan to Bethsheba, from the north to the south. Rebar, okay, was to be the faithful site where Nebuchadnezzar, the faithful site where Nebuchadnezzar would steal and the doom of Jerusalem and Judah after the debacle of 587 and 86, which Ezekiel is here prophesying, which is the account in 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 20 and 21. It is <coughs> already a sight fraught with significance for Ezekiel's fellow exiles. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. This declares the corrective purpose God has given in his terrible judgment. God would do good for his people even in the midst of a coming desolation. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, the Lord, the words typify Ezekiel message and longing that Yahweh may be known to all men, Israelite or non-Israelite, for what he is he is the one true God, the God of the world, the God of history, the
the God who speaks and does not speak in vain. That's what Taylor says. Folks, as we reflect on chapter 6, let us realize that this world is going to be judged by the one true God. And no matter what the narrative of the world is, no matter what the agenda is of the globalist elite, and no matter what presentation they have to present to the world to deceive them, to throw smoke and mirrors, to distract them from the truth, the fact is, is that the God of the Bible, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, is a sovereign God. And he is coming back. And when he does, he is not going to be full of compassion. He's not going to be full of love. He's coming back as judge, jury, and executor. Folks, let us stir up in our hearts the desire to spread the word, spread the gospel of Jesus Christ amongst our unsaved family and friends. Folks, I do trust that you're enjoying Ezekiel and there's much to come. And I do pray that as we ponder over these things this coming week, that the Lord will bless you. Until we speak again next week, have a blessed week.